Hello, and thank you for joining us at the Virginia Film Festival. I'm Matthew McClendon. I'm the J. Sanford Miller Family Director at the Fralin Museum of Art at UVA. And I am so pleased to date to be talking with Dennis Scholl, director and producer of Lifeline, Clifford Still, as well as with Dia Contaxis, co-producer and editor of the film. Among many things, Dennis Scholl is an award-winning documentary filmmaker focusing on arts and culture. His subjects and interviews have included Robert Redford, Frank Gehry, Wynton Marsalis, Ai Weiwei, The Astor Gates, and now, of course, Clifford Still. Dia Contaxis is a producer and editor of award-winning narrative and documentary films and a film educator. Her films have screened in festivals, television, and cinemas internationally, and she's currently associate professor at the Department of Cinematic Arts at the University of Miami School of Communication, where she also holds the appointments of associate dean for research and director of the Center for Communication, Culture, and Change. Welcome, Dennis and Dia. Hey, everybody. Thank Hello. Well, welcome virtually, as we all are these days. First of all, I just want to say thank you for sharing um, this beautiful documentary, this beautiful film with the audience of the Virginia Film Festival. Um, Dennis, we, we know one another and you know I've long been a fan of Clifford Still's work, uh, but I am sure that this uh, film is really going to open his work up to new audiences around the globe. And I'm personally, as an art historian, as a museum director, uh, thrilled about that. And I, I just want to start with the, the very foundational question. I, I am always interested in the process of filmmaking. I'm sure our audience at the Virginia Film Festival is as well. And that basic question is really, how did you come to make a film about Clifford Still? Well, to make a long story short, <laughs> I did not grow up in a household that had any cultural exposure. I was a guy that grew up in South Florida on the water, boating, fishing, diving, all those things. And I only went to a museum for the first time when I was 22 years old. And about a year later, I walked into the Metropolitan Museum in New York, walked around, didn't really care much for the Greek and Roman stuff. And then I wandered into this room that had four Clifford Still paintings into it. And I stood there and I felt consumed by the majesty of these paintings. I'd never had that feeling before. And dare say, it, maybe I've never had it in that zealous way since. And immediately he became my favorite artist. I went on to be a pretty big art collector, but no one can afford a Clifford Still painting. They started about $20 million and there's only about 150 of them that trade around the world um, with the rest of them being in the museum, which we'll talk about later but he became my favorite artist. And as I became a filmmaker over the last decade or so, uh, with much help by Dia, I might add, as, as, uh, as my co-producer and editor, but as I became a filmmaker, I always felt like I was making films about people I really cared about. And he was somebody I really cared about. So I went to Dean Sobel, who uh, is the just retired uh, head of the Clifford Still Museum. He was there before it was built. And I said to him, I'd like to make a film about Clifford Still. And he said, Dennis, you make films? So I, was a, I said, yeah, kind of. And I sent him some of my films and he called me back and he says, gee, Dennis, you do make films. And so he was kind enough to give me the opportunity to pursue this. And um, you know, the rest is what, what you saw on the screen just now. So I hope people enjoyed it. And it is a pure passion project for me. It took five years it took a lot of money. It took a lot of time. Uh, but, you know, that's what these films are about. They're about passion. Yeah, so fascinating. A couple of things I want to come back to in that. Uh, we've talked about our love of Still before, but I don't remember you telling me it was that experience of walking into the gallery at the Met. That is exactly how I discovered Clifford Still and fell in love with him. And I have to say that um, you know, the Met has changed over the years, but for many years there was a gallery where they had four or five paintings. Um, and it was, you know, for me as a, as a art historian, um, it was a quasi-religious experience. Every time I went into that gallery, I found the paintings, the way they were installed, so perfect. And I would go and kind of escape the the um, hectic pace of New York frequently and just sit there and be with be be in that gallery. So I, I love that we share that. I had no idea um, that that's that's really wonderful. It's a funny um, moment. And then you also when you walk in there, 
you know, these giant black paintings, you just disappeared into them. And Deborah, my wife, and I will be in the museum. And she knows when we get to that room, she should go do something else. Because right. I oh. her to sit there and be absorbed by no, no borders, no nothing, just right into the painting. The perfect contemplative experience that we all search for in museums. Spiritual, that's, spiritual that's for me. Great. Yeah, truly, tr truly transcendent. Um, and you, you've already anticipated one of my later questions, so we'll, we'll go to that now. It, I think you said it took you five years to make the film. Is that uh, fairly average for your projects, or was this a bit longer? I, you know, it, it just takes what it takes. Um, it, making a documentary film is way different than making a narrative film, because a narrative film, you gather a bunch of actors, you have them for 14 days or 21 days or three days, and then you hope you get it all and then you go edit. In this case, Dia would get you know some interviews and she would work on the material and we'd give her some uh, archival and then, and then we'd go back and get lucky and get another interview like Julian Schnabel or somebody like that. We'd catch a break, we'd get Mark Bradford. And so she was constantly having to weave things in and out. Um, each film is different. We did a film before that, uh, uh, I made a film called The Last Resort quickest thing I've ever done, 14 months from yeah. start to finish. And it just blew up. So you just don't know. I'm working on a film now that I started in 2012. Uh, Dia is doing it with us about a woman named Bunny Yeager. Uh, uh -huh. It takes what it takes, you know? Sure. Yeah, I think, I think that's what we all find in the artistic process. It takes what it takes. So Dennis, you've come with a, a long love of Clifford Still. Was that the same for you, Dia? Or was Clifford Still a, a new discovery for you? I honestly it was it was a fairly new discovery and I, I have to say that I also share the same med experience with you because when when oh. Dennis introduced me to the project uh, I happened to be in New York visiting for for another project and so I uh, you know the, the earliest access I had to actually for still was through the Met um, but I, I, I had a, a little bit of a different experience I had trouble finding I mean he was really in this own little section in the Met and I remember having to go through some roped section to, to sneak in there uh, to get access to the paintings, but it was uh, pretty much a, a unique experience. Uh, and that was my introduction um, to Clifford Still. I had the, the pleasure of being introduced to abstract art um, with another artist that uh, I worked with previously, and it was geometric abstraction was very different, but I think it really uh, prepared me for uh, working with, uh, with Clifford Still. Right. I find, you know, I'm a a big fan of abstract work. Um, and we're, depending on the, the narrative of the history of abstraction that you wanna, you want to um, work from, you know, we're over a hundred years into the history of abstract painting. People still find it difficult. People still get nervous with it. Uh, people still feel like they don't know how to approach it. Um, and so a lot of work I've done as a curator um, over the years has really been working uh, with people to give them some entry points to uh, abstraction. So I think, you know, what you've just said, you had already worked with a geometric abstraction, but still in that same kind of language, um, I'm sure that that was, that was really helpful. Um, so I, I, I'm really curious now, because you have such a long history and love of Clifford Still, Dennis, um, when you were approaching this project, did you have a kind of narrative arc already in mind um, that you wanted to realize? Or did that come about solely during the filming? Did that change? Did your preconceptions change in some way? Talk to me a bit about that process. Well, I, I go into each of these projects with incredibly deep research. I, I spend a lot of time building the movie I want to make and then seeing if there is material out there that will allow me to make it. And there never is. The film right. tells you what it wants to be. Okay. Unfortunately, you don't tell the film. And right. so in this case, uh, a miracle happened. I have to say it just straight up like that. There had been a lovely biopic done of still about, oh, I don't know, six or eight years before, maybe 10 years before uh, uh, by somebody in Denver. Very well done film, nice, clean, chronological. And I wanted to do something different. I knew I wanted to do a film about still, but I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do a psychological study because when people think about still, once you get beyond the paintings, they think of him as a difficult, irascible is the, of course the great word, guy. 
And I began to make the film with Dia and we looked around and we said, you know, we got a problem here. We got no moving images. We've got a bunch of photos. We've got a bunch of photos of paintings. You know, doesn't makes for a good catalog, but doesn't make for a good film. <laughs> And soon thereafter, I got a call from the archivist, the registrar, no, the archivist at the Still Museum, a woman named Jessie De La Cruz. And she said, you're not gonna believe what we found. I said, what'd you find? She goes, 28 hours, uh, 38 hours of audio tape of Still and 28 minutes of Super 8 home movies. Wow. And I was like, man, there is a God. <laughs> That's all I could say at that point. And, and, and I quickly like got them duped off, sent them to Dia. She was like, we were like high-fiving, you know, we were very excited. And then we had the audio tapes transcribed and that made the film because it's, and we didn't use it like, like overuse it. Dia was really tough on me about that. I would have had him talking the whole time. She says, you got to use this for impact. You can't use it, you know, just to make your point every single scene, but it's him talking about the art world and and he was very tough on the art world and so you got that impression on one side that he was this really difficult guy but then you had these super eight movies of him with his family and being a loving dad and so it really helped create the tension that we needed and of course dia used it beautifully so uh, that was a miracle i gotta say yeah, I, I agree. And I have to say, Dennis, you're always the easiest person to interview because you anticipate all of my questions and give me <laughs> great lead in. So it's so, it's so easy. <laughs> and that was, you know, at, again, as a curator, as an art historian, the moment in the film where you, you kind of talk about that discovery of the audio and the video, um, how had that been lost for so long? How was, how was that unknown? Well, Mrs. Still, after uh, Clifford Stowe passed, she became paralyzed uh, in terms of her ability to, to, to work with the material. She was afraid of disappointing him even when he was in the grave. And so for many, many years, she wouldn't even allow reproductions in magazines. Listen, when you, when you decide not to participate in history, history leaves you out. And so when the Clifford Stone Museum had gotten the archives finally and started sorting through it. It took years and years. I mean, we were there 10 years after they got the archive and there were still paintings that hadn't been unrolled. Right. So, so, you know, because you gotta be careful with condition and everything. So it was just a moment where they had finally gotten to looking in all the boxes and going through his materials and things. And there were these boxes of Super 8 and they're like, wonder what this is. Right. And then there were these audio tapes, these big, remember the big reel to reel tapes that used to oh, like, yeah. Yeah. So, and they began to play them and they were like, oh my God. So uh, I wonder, Dia, do, do you remember that day when I told you about this? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was a cool, you know, it was, I think that's one of the benefits of uh, embarking on this long-term project. So we had the luxury of uh, taking our time with this project and, uh, you know, in, in the process of making it, the project uh, evolved. Uh, it, we got new new access. Uh, you know, I also think uh, being able to get access to the daughters, you know, especially uh, the elder daughter um, was a coup. And that's something we couldn't have anticipated. So it's, uh, you know, it's one of the things that I really admire in, in working with Dennis is that he does, uh, you know, there, there's no pressure. We, we just have to make the film that we want to make, what we can make. And uh, how, however long that might take <laughs> with whatever surprises that might come along because we have to uh, satisfy our, our curiosity uh, first before anybody else. We're also, right. you know, this is, this is a project that uh, we did uh, because we were curious. We really wanted uh, to uncover the man, you know, um, behind the painter. And, uh, and we tried the best we could. So, and Dennis already alluded to this, you know, you have this incredible discovery and I can imagine the, the urge to use it in every scene, like he said, and you really, you really restrained, exactly. I can totally see that. Um, you really, uh, you know, restrained him with that idea. And so I, I wanna hear a little bit more about, you know, how you were approaching that, that methodology as an editor, how you were crafting the narrative arc as you were, um, finding this new material and then bringing it to the film. Well, as I said earlier, you know, it was a process of discovery. And uh, I think a lot of it um, had to do with the fact that we did not have a predetermined uh, 
you know, conclusion that we wanted the audience to get. It was uh, more about how much can we discover about this artist? How much do we want people to know about him? And it's not, you know, and we knew people had a very specific idea about who he is as a painter, but uh, there were things that we discovered about him as a person that uh, we knew we had access to that uh, other people had not heard or seen before. So, uh, so that's really what it became about, uh, kind of like delving deeper and deeper into that. Um, and at the end, we, we, we hope we did a very good um, you know, job in profiling who he was through the eyes of the people who knew him best. Um, you know, so, so situating him in the art world was not so much the goal. He already had been given that honor by the museum that was just built in Denver, but it was more kind of like uncovering the person. And so hopefully, you know, we, we started with the historical figure and ended up with the person. <laughs> that was, you know, if there was any structure in place, that was, you know, that was the goal. Absolutely. I think that that comes through really very clearly in your work. Uh, and you both touched on already one of my absolute favorite parts of the film. Uh, and I think what makes it so strong is the access to his daughters. Uh, and they provide, as you as you said, and people will, you know, have just seen the film, so they understand this, you know, still has had a, a very kind of gruff and curmudgeonly public image, and that's become the mythology around him for many reasons that you go into in the film. Uh, but his daughters had a very different relationship with him uh, and were able to bring that out and and as you said get toward more of the complicated personality of this incredible artist but i'm wondering you know you're having to balance um that mythology around still you're having to balance uh talking with the curators and the directors and the archivist with his family so what is what are some of the challenges of that as a filmmaker working with the family because you don't always have that opportunity yeah. Well, you know, there's there's three things I would say about that. Number one, I knew that I had to go meet with Sandra right away because she um, she is carrying the torch of the family. And um, and I went I flew to Arizona. I met her at the Phoenix Art Museum. She lives in a suburb outside of there. I told her about the project and she was she listened, but she was very careful because because she'd seen her father's legacy become something else. And uh, then the great moment was we got her, we, we flew her to Denver, we got her in the museum, we got her talking. And this was before we, I guess it was right when we knew we had the tapes, but even we didn't have the tapes, she channeled her father. She was there for a lot of the meetings when he was either disappointed or ebullient about something that happened. She channeled him. So we, we could use her voice as his voice if we didn't have his voice. So that was the first interesting thing. The second interesting thing was, of course, Sandra said yes. I called up uh, uh, Diane, and Diane didn't even come to the phone, just said no, and hung up. And uh, it took three years, and me working through Diane's daughter, Clifford Still's granddaughter, uh, who's great, and said, I'm going to get my mom to do this for you. Uh, and she called me one day, she says, mom won't do it, forget it. So three years, <laughs> and then suddenly the phone rings, and, and it's Diane's daughter, and she says, mom will talk to you now. Wow. Said, Why? Why is she willing to talk to me now? She goes, I don't know. She says, but I think it might be a cathartic thing for her. She's ready. So Dia and Ed, uh, our, 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 our camera guy, we all jumped on a plane, went out to California, spent the day with her, and she was wonderful. And she, and she was, you know, frail by then. And, and, and you know, um, and you could see that she was really exercising some demons in the discussion. And uh, it was just one of those days, one of the things you learn in documentary filming is because I've lost some subjects because many of my subjects are, are very elderly. Um, when the subject says they'll talk to you, you stop everything you're doing, you jump on a plane and you go do it because you could lose them any day. So she adds a lot to the film. She adds a lot of Absolutely. that kind of gentleness to the film. Yeah, I think they both, both of his daughters add a depth to the film that I, I really enjoyed as, as I watched it. I, um, one of the, you, I just want to say one thing. The scariest moment in the five years yes. was when I sent the film to Sandra because she's- yeah. oh, I, oh. And, and I'm, I'm always sure. afraid to show the films to my subject. And don't get me wrong, we don't do gotcha films. We're not looking to embarrass sure. anybody. We're just telling stories. 
but you, but it takes a long time to have a subject grow confident in what you're doing with them. And I thought I had that with Sandra, but I made some decisions and Dia and I, you know, talked about it that Sandra doesn't agree with and that's okay. But, but I, I waited to send her the film and I waited and I waited and <laughs> I finally did it. <laughs> I said, look, you know, you did it justice. So that was maybe the happiest moment for, for us, you know, making the film because Sandra really is the torch carrier for, you, you know, for this legacy. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other things that I really enjoyed about the film is how beautifully the work is shot, um, how beautifully the film overall is shot, uh, how cinema, uh, you know, the cinematography of the film and how nicely it supports Stills' paintings. So I'm wondering how you were thinking of that, what kind of conscious decisions you were making or unconscious decisions that happen that you look back on and say, wow, I didn't know I was doing that. But this really works to support, you know, the beauty, the grandeur of Clifford Still's paintings. One of the things that um, is really important is that when I find a really great team member for the films, I don't let them go. Right. And uh, Dia and I are working on our, I don't know, maybe our third or fourth film together. And actually Dia's husband is the DP. He's also a professor at the University of Miami. His name is Ed Talavera. And again, the minute I started working with Ed, that was it. I was done for anybody else. And he did a incredible job, particularly when we flew to London to shoot the opening of the ABEX show in the Royal Academy. They gave us two hours right. to shoot and we didn't leave for three days. Luckily for me, the woman that uh, was in charge of letting us in was Australian and I started telling her about my Australian wine project. Right. <laughs> and we just wouldn't leave. Finally, they literally begged us to leave. But we got three days and Ed was just, he used that camera in every nook and cranny of that show that he could. And, um, he's a really, really brilliant shooter. And, uh, and he got the program. He got the majesty of what the, you know, the paintings are about. He, we would put people next to them so you would feel the monumentality of it. So uh, you got to have a team to make these films. And if you want to make a great film, you got to have a great team. And I feel very yeah. lucky that, you know, that these folks want to continue to do stuff with me. So I feel very privileged. Yeah, it, it's, it's very clear that, that, that this was something that you all really thought about. Um, and again, as a, as a museum person, I really appreciated that. One of the other things, you know, it wasn't just the cinematography, uh, at times architecture really played a role, I felt in the film, particularly in those, those gallery sequences in uh, the Royal Academy, which I, you know, as soon as I saw that, I thought, oh, wow, they thought that they were making a film about a great American artist, and here they are having to go across across the ocean to, to film his work. Uh, but there are some really beautiful moments in the Clifford Still Museum in Denver um, that we, we've talked about that um, I think the using the architecture to frame the paintings really beautifully. Um, I, I, I just so appreciated that. Um, one of the other things that I appreciated was you have a number of contemporary, of the leading contemporary artists um, uh, speaking about Still's work, and I, you know, just off the top, I think Julian Schnabel, Julie Moretu, Mark Bradford were in there. Um, I, I'm curious. It's not a bad trifecta to have. I know exactly. Right, exactly. Anyone that's following contemporary art, that is, that's a pretty amazing trifecta. Um, so I'm wondering how that came about and why that decision was made. Well, I'm making a film with Dia about an old dead white guy, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not, that's not where we are today. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that that's not where, where, where we are. Right. You got to contemporize the film in a number of ways, you know, having the museum is a great way to contemporize it, but having Mark Bradford talk about Clifford Still and saying he loves Clifford Still because Clifford Still was not afraid of black. I mean, that's a great, that's a great Mark Bradford line. Having Julie talk about her moment with Still, which is similar to Dia's moment, my moment, and your moment, Still does that to people. You know, having her talk about that in a such a profound way. And then Julian, of course, you know, I mean, that was really the scariest moment for me because Julian's, I think, one of the great independent filmmakers in the world. And, um, and having him talk about Still and, and talk about, you know, truth in the journey, because that's really what the film's about. Uh, and then, of all things, finding that that archival audio of still 
talking about Schnabel to his wife after right. he met him for the first time with Ross Bleckner. Um, I mean, that was just a miracle, frankly. So, uh, but having then contemporizes the film and makes people say, oh, I, I know who Mark Bradford is. He was on 60 Minutes, you know, those, right. those kind of things. And um, you gotta know, you gotta know who, who matters. And of course, you know, some of these artists are friends and people that we've, uh, whose work we've owned. We certainly have owned uh, Mark's work, Julie's work and Julian's work. So as a collector, you know, yeah. it's okay to call up and say, could you give me 15 minutes? Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, aside from the artists, you have one of the other great ubiquitous presence in the art world, uh, Jerry Saltz. And I just loved that you got Jerry to read Still's biting criticism of critics themselves. I thought that that was, um, you know, humorous um, as Jerry often is, uh, but also uh, provide a great insight, a kind of really um, sharp insight into Still's relationship with his contemporary art world. And it really got me thinking, you know, he was so at odds. Um, he was, integrity was so important to him. Integrity as an artist, integrity within the art world, that really put him at odds uh, personally with the art world. And I was thinking about today, you know, would we have a Clifford, could we have a Clifford still today with the close connections of, you know, the global fair system with critics, with curators, with museums, kind of everything that Clifford still chafed against. Um, do, do you think there's room for Clifford still today? I mean, the only artist that comes to mind is really David Hammonds. David Hammonds has uh, been able to work outside the system when he wants to do and inside the system when he wants to. Right. Um, although I'd be interested from Dia hearing about the edit of the Jerry Saltz piece, because we spent a lot of time, I wouldn't say fighting, but we spent a yeah. lot of time fussing about it. Because right, Dia, we knew we had gold there. I mean, it was amazing. Well, I think we both agree that we we um, um, we used Salz's segment to kind of like ground things a little bit. Um, you know, as you said, uh, Clifford still can be perceived as as so um, um, you know adamant about being outside of the gallery system and not being commercialized. But uh, but we thought it was really nice to to show the other side of that. You know, how is that perceived from? Uh, from the point of, uh, of a contemporary critic. But I think what also what um, Jerry said, uh, he sets us up for, for um, contextualizing, you know, how art um, uh, stands uh, with time, you know, and he, he says the most important line in the film is like, you know, uh, the best critic of, of art is time and I trust time, you know, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but, uh, but I think, you know, in so many ways, there's so much truth in that statement and uh, the way we handled art, the way we read art today, uh, you know, removed from when it was created, uh, the way uh, there's continuity in art, there's dialogue in art. Um, and uh, what a better person to say that line that somebody who, who doesn't come from a place of, you know, such, uh, I mean, Jerry's an authority, but uh, the way he delivers it, I thought it was fantastic. We were lucky. <laughs> I never thought I'd have a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, critic use the word pimps in my film. That's just. <laughs> exactly. It was, it was really a great moment. I, I agree. And, you know, as, as much as still was at odds with the art world and, and held it at bay, I think it's also important, you know, there's this mythology around him that he never sold a painting and he did sell paintings. He sold when he needed to sell. Um, you know, he, he always, um, he was always respected. Uh, and so um, one of the other things that I love uh, learning about still is, you know, he would sell paintings and then miss them and then kind of create replicas for Repl right what, what what were they what were they called what did he what replicas. Were? Replicas. replicas yes right exactly um which again i think adds a great deal of insight into this this complex um complex character we're almost um at our time um and time is kind of one of the places that are uh, one of the subjects you just brought up dia um so the the documentary is a little over an hour long um, how much footage did you cut from? I think that's all, people don't realize how much footage actually <laughs> gets left behind. 30, 30 times, 30X? 
uh, yeah, uh, you know, we never we never did the final math on that. Uh, right. <laughs> I don't think we wanted to know. You've got a hard drive that's about. <laughs> I know that, and she complains wow. about it all the time because we it had uh, totally you know it, so. uh, five years of work that Dennis did, and then tons of archival. You know, a lot of uh, archival that came from the museum. I mean, we we there was a lot of material. Got to say thank you to the museum uh, because Absolutely. they made available everything to us. 12,000 personal photos, every image of every painting, drawing, and sculpture. Uh, this audio, this video, the ephemera, his baseball glove, uh, you know, his, his palette, his brushes, his, right. his uh, we literally had some of the, some of the pigment that he was using that they let us use. So, uh, I mean, they really, Dean just opened up the, you know, the cabinet for us and let us go to it. And it made a difference in the film. You can feel Absolutely. the texture of it. Absolutely. So as you were coming to the final cut of the film, were there, was there anything that was non-negotiable that had to be in the film for either or both of you? Dia is really good for me because she <laughs> pushes me. And I am somebody who tells stories like this, A, B, C, D, E, F. And, um, and Dia tells her stories, A, F, I, J. And boy, was that, you know, this was the breakthrough film for the two of us because the, the film we made before this, the couple we made before this, she kind of let me do most of that. And this time she said, uh-uh, this is not a linear story. It's a psychological story and you can jump around. So that was great for me. So the only thing that was non-negotiable to her is that I didn't march through it. And boy, it's a better film for it. I'm so grateful. What do you think, Dia? Was there anything non-negotiable for you? No, I think I no, I think there were some sensitive moments with the daughters, you know, which I think uh, we thought about very carefully when we went back and forth about, you know, do we want to go there? Do you know is it, and um, I'm, I'm all happy with the choices that we made. I think Dennis balances me in a very nice way too, because um, you know you need that, you need that dialogue uh, in, in the process of making a film like that, where it's a process of discovery for us as well. And uh, a lot of it became uh, what it is through conversations that we've had. And I'm really happy with the final choices that we made. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, we discussed, we didn't, have big fights and everything that needed to be there was was there ultimately. You get a lot when you work with somebody who is really trained classically and is, you know, an academician because she's thinking about Maya Duran and she's thinking about people like that. And I'm I'm just thinking about the next shot, you know? And, and so together, I mean, this has really been good for me. It's really opened up my filmmaking. It's made me think differently. And I, I'm grateful for that. That's why I'm not letting her go. Yeah, and we also uh, you we're also dealing with a subject of like, you know abstract painting so we we thought we could be a little more abstract right <laughs> <laughs> i love that oh so, one last question i i'm always just personally fascinated in this when i talk with artists and filmmakers about their projects looking back what was the one big surprise for you in the whole process that you came away with um that that's really stayed with you other than you know getting the surprise of the audio and the film footage but personal surprise um that really maybe changed how you were thinking about um the project yeah you go first uh, well i mean i, I don't want to preempt people's reaction but they will you know um i think i was mostly surprised by by people's uh, reaction to the film people were not prepared, like I think everybody has uh, people who like and admire the work of still have a certain idea of who he is. And I think they were not prepared to discover the person <laughs> that we discovered. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it comes a little bit as a surprise. Uh, again, I think we, we did a, an honest portrayal based on the material that we had access to, which, uh, you know, which I think does justice to the subject. But, uh, but I think people have their own personal idea because of that personal connection with with art and painting that people have that uh, sometimes they don't want anybody else to interfere with. And I feel like we may have interfered with it a little bit. <laughs> for, for me, I went into the film concerned that, that, that I wouldn't be able to convey 
that still did all this from a point of integrity. And I came out the other end feeling really great that somebody who I have revered for their work um, for all my life, basically, for right. adult life, turned out to be the person that I thought he was based upon, as Dia said, based upon what we were given to work with. He was a man of integrity. He gave up a lot for his art. When I talk to artists, and I do talk to artists a lot, Matthew, as you know, I do studio visits and I'm running an art center. I talk to people about make the work that you want to make and, 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 and have integrity when you're making work. It doesn't matter where your career is. It doesn't matter who's looking at the work. Make the work you want to make. I try to do that with the films. I try to make the film that I think is representative of, of the subject. And I came out of this thinking this was a guy who gave up a ton of opportunity to preserve his integrity. And you can't say more than that about somebody. So that was a real honor and a privilege. Yeah, that absolutely comes through. And again, as a lifelong lover of Still's work, I really appreciate that too, Dennis. So, so thank you for that, that gift uh, to me. Uh, and thank you for making this, again, beautiful film that I think greatly enriches the story around Clifford Still. I know it's being seen in festivals and museums all across the country, uh, which, is, which is wonderful given our current circumstances. And we're so thrilled to have had it at the Virginia Film Festival. And thank you so much for joining me. And thank you everyone out there in Zoom land. Um, I can't believe I'm you... not in Charlottesville right now. I know, That's... it's so, it's there. just, Exactly. Well, soon, as soon as we can travel again, Dennis, I'll, I'll be down in Miami and you'll have to come to Charlottesville. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.